Coming up, the Jade Rabbit gets a second chance at life. Some Olympians are getting special space gold. And get off my lunar front yard, you kids. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins now. And welcome to Space Vidcast episode 7.04 for Saturday, February 15th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, talented Gary and Higginbotham will be your hosts for this episode. Let's go ahead and get started. Just when we thought it was dead, no, it has sprung back to life. China's Jade Rabbit, or U2, has come back from the dead. Now, on uh, January 25th, it was forced into an early sleep mode after a mechanical error. Uh, China didn't really tell us what was going on with a mechanical error, as we know it had to go into an early sleep. And now that's bad because on the surface of the moon, when you go into night, it gets to be something ridiculous like nearly negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is really, really cold. And it was supposed to wake up on Monday the 10th, which was a few days ago, and nothing. And then a couple days later, still nothing until Wednesday the 12th, when suddenly, out of the blue, bing, bing, beep, beep, Sputnik style, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> bing, bing, beep, 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 beep. Yeah. Uh, the Jade Rabbit has, in fact, come back to life. And so the probe, the rover, I'm sorry, the rover that mm -hmm. China has placed on the moon, Jade Rabbit, uh, seems to be running again. And that's kind of awesome. So they can kind of continue down their plans uh, and... and continue to forge forward not at full capacity but um from what we can tell uh, good enough if you will which is always a good thing well it's scary because during that hibernation period it can't charge its batteries uh it can't communicate with earth so it's kind of a here's hoping it works well and when it went down it didn't go to, it's sort of like uh just forcing your computer to go off it didn't go down in the correct sort of downing <laughs> just well, hard power pull the power of. plug yeah and that that's always a little bit scary so um yeah no so good news for china great news for china i uh, more stuff on the moon more stuff on uh, alien bodies robots humans all that stuff and it's awesome that it's working again uh so uh turkey has launched a satellite turksac 4a communication satellite here's the launch coverage <laughs> Ignition start. And we have liftoff. Liftoff of an ILS Proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the Turksat 4A spacecraft on board. And boy, that, that really was exciting. But about 10 seconds after liftoff, the rocket does a roll maneuver and will soon experience maximum dynamic pressure, which is the maximum aerodynamic load on the vehicle. For Proton, this corresponds to about Mach 1.6 and occurs at one minute and two seconds after liftoff. All right, now at this point it's just animation. So there you go. That was that was the uh, that was the liftoff. That was the 394th Proton rocket launch since 1965. It was the first Proton rocket launch of 2014 uh, from International Launch Services, and um, that will be a communication satellite for Turkey, which was just launched up into the outer space cosmosy area. Um, there you go. Uh, this is a story that makes me sad, this next one. <sighs> um, actually, uh, so I'll tell you the story. That yeah. is one in four Americans, mm -hmm. one in four, one quarter of Americans does not know that the earth revolves around the sun. Let that one sink in again. So uh, now, I thought that was really bad. I'm like, oh, we are so dumb. Until I saw the chart of the rest of the world, right. and then that made me even sadder. Uh, but this was a survey that was done to uh, more than 2,200 people just in the United States mm -hmm. for that part of the survey, for that column. Um, and it was uh, conducted by the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. I love that graphic. It's right? kind of awesome. A flat earth with the moon and the uh, sun rotating around it. Uh, there were 10 questions on the question, an average score of 6.5, which I don't believe is a passing grade. 65% yeah. I think is an F. It, well, I think it's barely, barely, barely. And 74% uh, of respondents knew that the Earth did in fact revolve around the sun, not the other way around. Now, do you have the other chart? 
Yeah. Uh, I don't have it handy, so... Yeah, um, so South Korea was also asked the same question, and uh, they are the only uh, country, from what we can tell, that actually got a better grade than we did, where 86% of their respondents answered correctly. 86%. That's the best we have That's in this study. That's the best. Uh, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. And the worst was the European Union at 66%. Um, 66% of Europeans know how the Earth works, yeah. essentially. Our Earth's I sun... System. Yeah, that's just disturbing across the board. And it, that wasn't the only <laughs> question, but that one in particular just seems like the single most basic thing you could pretty much ask anyone. And apparently with any luck, they might get it right. Zigger does bring up a valid point, which is one in 20 Americans are still too young to not poop their pampers. So one out of four isn't too bad. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It I, should, don't, I don't think they once, asked anyone once in Pampers this question. Yeah, yeah I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they didn't go up to an infant and go, all right, infant, question for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I just, I think this just goes to prove that there needs to be more science education, not just in the U.S., but around the world. The best part was that most respondents said that they thought that there should be more science education. They were, they were totally <laughs> Because they're like, I don't know. It. I don't know what the answer to these things are. So, I, I, I mean, have no idea how know, this works. Good Good call. There Good were some other questions on here. People. Um, I like, is the center of the earth very hot? It was a true false question. A true false question. I mean, when it's worded that way, how else would you word it that way? Um, I think uh, India got the worst percentage there with 57%. Oh, no, I'm sorry. China got the worst uh, with 56%. Um, yeah, we were, yeah. All radioactivity is man-made. True false question. 72% in the U.S. got that correct. It's just, it hurts. It's very, it hurts. very painful. It hurts. Very painful. So. By the way, the, the, for, in case you're watching and you don't know the answer to that, false. <laughs> <laughs> Not all radioactivity is man-made. And in fact, um, cosmic radiation is one of the uh, stumbling blocks for humans getting to Mars and humans staying on the moon. And we keep the International Space Station kind of tucked nicely within our magnetosphere to prevent that cosmic radiation from harming our astronauts. It's kind of a neat, neat little safety shield that our Earth uh, kind of extends out for us. Um, all right, uh, let's move on. Uh, science Thanks. education is a good thing. Great place to get started right here because we're interested and we're fun and you can ask questions live. Um, and as, as Space Vidcaster 00 says, this is why we need better STEM in schools, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, yeah. There. And then uh, Frag971 says, I do believe these studies are flawed. Who's the target demographic, ages, question asked, education? Uh, you know, that's somewhat valid, right? I mean, who was your user base if you are going to a bunch of third graders? Because mm, that's not really fair either. It's not um, entirely fair, but still, I would sort of hope. We have a friend uh, who have a seven-year-old, and I... I, I Next time I see her, I will ask her for sure, and I will let you know uh, how she answers. Uh, but I, I'm near positive she would get that one right. Now, we still have the Olympics going on. Yes, we do. And there's a really cool thing that happened. Well, scary, scary thing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, here's some footage from one year ago today. This is the meteor that uh, blew up over Russia. And you can kind of watch it, and then it go explode. Uh, yeah. So awesome. Yeah, and you'll remember, and there's just a loop of a bunch of these different things. So this meteor uh, fell to Earth and exploded over Russia, and you got a bunch of different sh footage here. This happened one year ago today, which means uh, all the Olympians competing in the Olympics today, if they get gold, what happens? They get a very special gold medal for the Sochi Olympics that also has a piece of this meteorite embedded in the metal itself. Now I want to be Olympian. How I don't cool know what I would that? compete as in <laughs> or what, but I definitely want a I want that gold medal. How uh, already just having a gold Olympic medal is really cool. Uh, yeah. Having a gold Olympic medal that was specially made like for one day out of the the Olympics that has a piece of meteorite that's even cooler. Yeah. Uh, that that's that's pretty I, awesome. I think it's fascinating. Uh, there are only fifty of those medals that are made, right? Yeah, and, and uh, not all fifty of them are going to be given out. Uh, as it's only can I buy one? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven different events that are going on today, mm. so that are even eligible at all. And then uh, so some are, of course, are going to the to the winners. Some are one is going to the um, Chelyabinsk 
uh, museum. It was the Chelyabinsk Oblast region where the meteorite happened to come down at. Um, and then one staying in Sochi, and then the rest are going to private collector. So quite possibly, I'm a private collector. So you Olymp- are now Olympic Committee private collector. <laughs> we will put it to good use. We will use it to inspire the planet. So uh, He'll just wear go ahead, it every day. send it my. I will wear it every day. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right. Um, before we go into break, <laughs> mystery rock. Mystery Mars rock has been solved. I think we covered this story a while ago. I feel like we did. But uh, even if I we don't remember. I know okay. I looked at it. I don't remember if we had, did right it on air. So um, you can see uh, on the screen um, that's basically the same shot. Uh, one, is, they're a couple days apart, and suddenly in one of them there is a mystery rock that appeared. Yeah, JPL or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, had said that they spotted this "quote unquote" jelly donut-sized rock on Sol 3540. Um, they had since dubbed it Pinnacle Island, and uh, there was actually a lawsuit that came against NASA by one particular individual uh, who said that it was NASA's duty to look into this because this could have been alien life. And so JPL was going to look into it anyway because it was sort of weird and a strange sort of thing. They realized it was actually a rock that basically Opportunity Rover kicked for the most part. Uh, They went back and they looked at the tracks where Opportunity had been, where Opportunity was going, looked at this rock, looked at that rock, and said, oh, this rock looks like that rock, and we probably just kicked it over there. That's pretty much what happened. Uh, It was a rock that fell off. Uh, Keep in mind that when we look at pictures of Mars, they look like still images. And I think a lot of people don't really think of weather or you know, airflow or anything along those lines, or that things could break, fall off, and then travel. Mars we does. Did. Mars does have atmosphere and windstorms. Kind of a thing. So that's another thing. That so there can you go. Happen. It's a rock from another piece of Mars. <laughs> Yay! Good job, guys. So uh, before we head into break, um, uh, those of you watching live, you're watching on the new live stream player that's embedded on the Space Vcast site. Hopefully, it's working for you. And um, that was done because a bunch of these patrons made it possible. Space Vidcast is now part of Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash Space Vidcast, uh, you can subscribe to Space Vidcast uh, and every episode uh, commit some sort of a dollar value. And one of the reward levels at uh, anywhere from a dollar to five dollars is the screen you just saw, which are our patrons. Uh, these are the Space Vidcast producers. These are the people who commit $5 or more per episode to Space Vidcast. And this is what helps make Space Vidcast go. We call it, It's a value for value proposition. So unlike traditional television, which Space Vidcast would never air on t- traditional television. No it, just, it doesn't have no. the... So if you get value out <laughs> of this show, we just ask, put some value back into the show. Uh, it's your dollars that help contribute to make the show better. And if you go to SpaceFitCast, I'm sorry, Patreon.com slash SpaceFitCast, you can help contribute. Right now, as of this live recording, we've got 72 patrons, 72 people willing to add value to the SpaceFitCast show, uh, totaling $213 uh, per episode and it's super easy for you to do this you just head on in you say I want to become a patron and you're gonna say all right I want to commit and then you can type in any number you want you can even do less than a dollar now there are no rewards at less than a dollar uh, but that's okay you don't have to have a reward uh, you could choose a, a one dollar reward five dollar reward ten dollars you could even say you know what? I'm gonna commit a hundred dollars per episode even though there's there's no like special hundred dollar reward you'll just get the highest reward level possible now you might say okay that's per episode So that kind of sucks because then I don't know how much I'm going to spend per month. That's not entirely true. There are two features of Patreon that are awesome and designed just for you. The first is that you can set a monthly cap. So uh, I had a user say, look, I really want to keep spending money uh, through PayPal, which Patreon supports. uh, But more importantly, I don't know how much I'm going to be spending per month. So it's really hard for me to do this. Well, actually, you can. You can say, look, I don't want to spend any more than 20 bucks a month. I think the demo has 40 bucks a month because, you know, why not? Um, (laughs) And then the second thing is, even if you, you're you hard-pressed, you're not billed right away. So you're billed at the end of the month, and you can cancel any time. So if you're, if you're looking at this, you're going, oh, I just cannot afford this, you can opt out of it. You can choose not to pay the Patreon part of it. I, we would hope that you don't. But you, as the user, have total control. And the reason this is better than something like Space Vacast Epic is when we're not broadcasting shows, when we're not making content, when we're not adding value, then you don't pay for it. So you only give value to the value that we add. We think it's an exceptionally fair system. Um, so uh, one other thing, um, there, there were a couple of emails of saying, hey, I'd like to do this or that or some custom things. Um, one of them was um, 
I don't want my name posted in Patreon on those screens. So what you can do is if you want to go into Patreon and change your name to your username uh, and then select the gold and we'll display your username because we build those screens based on the Patreon export mm -hmm. every week and they're updated every week. Um, and they're updated automatically through Patreon, not through an external source. And the second thing is, um, if I go outside of it, can I add my name back in? It's uh, kind of hard for us to do. It is possible, contact me. Um, so anyhow, there's all of that. If we missed your notes, please go into Patreon, or if we missed your name change, please go into Patreon and either change your name in Patreon, or uh, you can select no reward, and we'll still be able, you'll still be giving value to the show, but your name will not show up on the screen if you choose no reward. All right, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining us and uh, helping out with Patreon. I was about to end the show for absolutely no reason. Um, awesome. We actually have two more segments, so let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about Bigelow wanting to set up some parameters around what you can do with real estate on the moon. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Space Vidcast. Uh, Bigelow, uh, not that long ago, uh, s sent out some information as to what he wants to do on the moon. I thought this would be a really good topic for us to discuss because there is no outer space treaty on the moon that everyone has actually approved. Right. Uh, so right now, there was a uh, there was a treaty for the moon, a moon treaty, I think is actually what it was called, an mm -hmm. international moon treaty. Uh, but the U.S. didn't sign it because it prevented... Um, um, corporations, companies from doing anything on the moon. You couldn't actually have a company go out there and do something. Right. It prevented all of that. And we were like, no, that's stupid. And that happened like in the 60s and 70s. So we had the foresight to say, no, no, that's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> but he wants to see clarification from the Federal Aviation Administrative Office of Commercial Space Transportation, or AST. It's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. uh, whether launching moon habitat, which is relevant to Bigelow because they make giant space-based habitats, Launching them and then uh, Habitat allows them to have a zone of operation in which other persons are prevented from entering. Thinking of this as having your own house, right? Mm -hmm. We have a house, we have an apartment. Other people can't just randomly walk into our apartment. That not be allowed, right? right? That's your area. But on the moon, there's no such necessarily equal rights. Now, it takes it a step further. It's not just entering your house. There's a, like a perimeter zone around it. Um, Citing another common example, the International Space Station has something called a keep-out zone. Mm -hmm. You have to stay at least 200 kilometers, 250, I think it's 200 Something kilometers, like away from the space station. That's its keep-out zone, right. unless you are granted entry into the sp uh, space station keep-out area. Right. Uh, and that helps protect the space station from anyone doing anything weird. It's sort of like a no-fly zone around it's uh, a no like fly zone. trade zone. And so he's kind of saying, lines. look, we, we kind of want something similar. Right. Um, for robotic bases, you know, the, the keep out, the, the zone would be smaller because you right. don't need as much space. But for a habitable zone, you sh we should be able to have more more room for those habitated areas right. that, you know, other countries and especially other areas of the U.S., you just can't go into. It's not your home. So this brought up a couple of interesting things. Um, is a is that a valid idea, right? Yeah. Should we be should we be say setting up regulation on the moon before we even have Habs on the moon, right? Because right? Bigelow could go to the moon right now and they could set up their moon base and they have competition from no one. They have competition from absolutely no yeah. one. There's no one else. It's a whole that would lot be of able... neener neener neener. Yes, <laughs> but there. I think what will happen is once Bigelow does that, and I think uh, Bigelow and then private uh, aerospace, not uh, you know United Launch Alliance, some. Pr private company launching it sure. up there. Delta, Atlas, oh heck, even Arion. And, and a lot of different things would be able to launch this right. up to the moon. Um, once they've got it on the moon, um, I think, and other countries and, and companies see what they're able to do, I think they're going to go, oh, that's really cool. There actually is a business plan there. Right. There is an IP, the value to the intellectual property that's happening there. Mm -hmm. We want to get in on that too. Right. And so... I think he's smart in thinking that, okay, we should probably set some of this up now. 
But should we, right? Should we wait until we maybe get a few up there and then kind of figure out how to work that? Or should we set it all up now? Like, who has the best views? When <laughs> should we get the lawyers involved, I guess, is really what it comes down to. I, I mean, I think I think as soon as possible. Uh, I, I just out of curiosity, I kind of Googled moon real estate. Sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. I was curious. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because in the event that somewhere down the line someone decides that that the real estate that people down here on earth have been selling on the moon that which they say is up to 7.5% of the entire moon has been sold right but but that could be a potential issue if we grant Bigelow or anyone you know if we mm-hmm. grant this sort of you know, yes, once you uh, maintain a space, it is your space, you may lock the door, nobody else can come in Mm -hmm. kind of thing, then I think that could theoretically open up the gateway for all these other people who say, well, wait, wait, I've got a deed. I have real estate on the moon, which becomes a weird, crazy little area. Not to mention then, uh, at that point, uh, and I believe in the moon treaty, it says something along the lines of how... Um, you know, bans military use of celestial bodies for weapon testings in military bases. And there's a whole lot of stuff. Uh, Vax actually in the chat room uh, linked to it in Wikipedia, which you can always go there and look at that. Uh, but that also brings up the uh, sort of question about what do we do about the things that are already on the moon. Actually, Dutta just mentioned that, which, by the way, he should be directing the show. I don't know how he's chatting in the chat room. For shame. Telepathy. To- ooh, ooh. Or, or um, minions. There you um, go. Uh, he says, I think at the very least, the existing sites like Apollo landing locations and right. the one small, small step should be preserved for eternity. Who should be the steward of that? Who knows? That's actually a very good question, right? Right, because I mean, in, in the the way I came about that was I was thinking, okay, well, Bigelow Space Habitat, Space Hotel. Who, you know, what what view is not a bad view on the moon? But hey, wouldn't it be awesome if I could overlook the Apollo? You know, anything from Apollo that's been left there. You know, mm-hmm. that would be a spectacular view, I think, in general. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it opens up a lot of doors, oddly enough, that we may or may not want to actually open. Does that make sense? It, it, it's sort of like this, This, yes, I want this one good thing to come out of this, but I'm, I personally am a little bit of afraid that it, it could start to uh, get us into some spaghetti mess, I guess. I, that I don't know that makes sense. That. Uh, David R. says we should have property rights on the moon. For example, at the moment, if you dug up some water... On the moon, some mm-hmm. ice. Right. Uh, and by the way, how cool would that be, right? So if you wanted a awesome. bottle of, of moon water, I, I, could, I see a market for that, right? For uh, for realsies moon water. Right. Someone saying, yeah, I would love water that came from the moon. Tastes kind of graphite-y. Um, uh, if you wanted to sell it, you couldn't prove that you own it, so you can't do it commercially. Right. Currently. Right. Right. So. I, I mean, that's an interesting, That's that's the sort of, tangled web we weave with ice with this one i suppose that's my sort of concern in general yes i sort of i i do uphold the idea that i if i were to potentially have a habitat on the moon or mars or anywhere sure i would be i would want to be able to lock the door just just but you in can general. you can lock you should be able to lock, i mean it's going to be an airlock right so <laughs> yes you can lock that door I, yeah i i really really hope you can lock that door there's the physical lock but then there's there's the privacy lock i guess uh, yeah it is it's very interesting and I, I don't i don't really know what the answers are um you know that came up with the google lunar x prize as well with the rovers um you know that i wasn't one of the milestones or one of the potential milestones for a while to be able to take pictures of some of the things that were yeah, yeah. head up head up to the apollo landing sites and then be able to take pictures of but them. then it was yeah. a sort of like yeah but don't get too close yeah, yeah you know yeah. There, there's a lot of gray area not to make a pun um <laughs> i see what you did there i see what you did there didn't want to so is now the time to get the lawyers involved are we close think, enough yes. are we close enough to actually putting something on the moon the moon um because you know bigelow's got their halves but who else has something that they can actually put up there uh and you know when is that actually going to happen right. i don't foresee this I, and maybe i'm wrong but i don't foresee an actual have on the moon happening within the next decade <laughs> boy do i hope i'm wrong wouldn't right. it be cool wouldn't it be cool to have a permanent 
outpost on the moon within the next decade. I think that's almost a better time to be to start making those decisions. Uh, there was an area in Minnesota that we used to live where uh, one particular city said, you know, a certain percentage of our city will never, ever, ever be touched, ever. And they made those decisions way back before the 1960s when everyone went, you know, earth crazy. I, but they were already there when they made those decisions. Sure, 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 sure. But I, I think having a level head and having little to no stake in the outcome, other than what is best for everyone, is the time to make those decisions. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I think the flip side of that, and I don't disagree with that, I think the flip side of that coin is right now in the commercial aerospace industry, there's a lot of um, preventing regulation. Right, making sure. sure that there's not a lot of regulation that gets in your way. There's right. not a lot of red tape because if we start adding this regulation right now, maybe that will extend the amount of time it takes to get that lunar habitation up there because now you got to go through all this regulation to well, get there. There's regulation and and then there's sort of guidelines. I think a, a general, even something stupid like a twenty foot rule. I don't. Think, okay. From my doorstep to the next doorstep. Yeah, but how do you how do you own that? I guess is the next part, right? So do you own it because you landed there and now now that's yours because you landed there? Or do you need to buy it? How? Right. How, how well, does that? So now that's regulation. Yeah. Right? And it's not yeah. a rule anymore. And so now, because right now, at this exact moment in time, if I were to land and go to the moon and put something there, go ahead and stop me. You can't reach me. Uh, right? So, right. And then I would just say, no, look, this is mine. I claim it. Right? Just plant my flag. That's old school. Old school. Like, America now. Right. Right? So, I, that's pretty much what happened. But if, if we started in advance saying, okay, well, no. No, no, no. Actually, this is own. These are the rules. you got to be able to do this. Right. Maybe that's good. Maybe there's... I, I actually have no idea. I and, You know, this is one of the few times where lawyers actually come in really handy. Yeah. No. For, like, for realsies. Like, a lawyer might be able to sit there and hash this stuff out and go, okay, well, this is what actually makes sense for people. Right. This is what would allow people to actually get to the moon and and continue the industry moving forward. Uh, and this is kind of how we think it should play out. And the, here's your set, here's your set of rules, make that law. So, yeah. Yeah, even just the simply defining areas or, you know, just getting down into those those details so that we're all having the same conversation. Does that make sense? So we're all using the same words in the same way as opposed to, well, this is mine and, and I, of course, get a front yard and... Yeah, so Nick Forever brings up another valid point, which is general guidelines equals common sense. So if if do we even if we're if we're so so early in this process right now, why can't we just use common sense, right? I mean, that seem don't approach, don't approach the Apollo landing sites and screw up the landing site. I mean, do it from afar, right? And you know, use high power telescopes and high powered imagery so you can take pictures of it and go, oh wow, that's awesome. But stay away until we can figure out how to preserve that, right? So sure. that you don't get your footprints all over it. Sure. So that we, you know. Common sense. At least that seems common sense to me. Sure, I, but I then, feel like anyone else would understand that too. Yeah, you well, you would think, but maybe other countries look at it and say, okay, cool, yep, Apollo 11, no problem. But 16, eh, who cares that much? Actually, David R., one option is to create a lunar sovereign wealth fund that would own the whole moon. They could then sell land to raise cash to invest. The cash would be used in time for infrastructure for the moon nation. So basically, the moon becomes its own country, essentially. It's that, not a bad idea. Yeah. And then and then they would take care of the infrastructure necessary on the moon. Sure. It's hard, though. I mean, it's too early. It's a, it's a chicken-egg scenario right yeah. now, right? Because, uh, sure, you can do that, but how are they going to get infrastructure on the moon? Right. How are they going to take care of stuff? Who's... It's... it's. Yeah. I think that's primarily part of the issue. Uh, what do you think, right? So... Um, when should we be creating laws for the moon? What kind of laws should we be creating? Should we be restricting who can have access to the land? Who should have access to the land? Yeah. Right? Should it be countries, corporations, people? Uh, what about all those lunar deeds that, right? Because how do you, how do I claim? I, I, everyone kind of everyone kind of laughs and says, "Ah ha ha ha, that's a cute little funny thing." You know, there's no sure, legal backing. But you, somebody's making money off of that. Well, they're making money off of it. But secondly, uh, why not? Who? Why can't they just say, I own that now? Right. I, there's no law that says that you can't do that. So what happens with all of those? And then what happens when Bigelow sticks something on top of that or any other company sticks something on top of a, a quadrant that's already been sold? Do they have to buy it? But what do you think? Leave your comments. <laughs> yeah. Leave your comments on the YouTube uh, uh, room or in uh, spacefigcast.com. Uh, we'd love to hear what you think. And speaking of your comments, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, 
Comments from last week's show. You guys are funny, awesome, and intelligent. And we're going to talk about what you said. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One. Zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back. I had to hit my buttons really quick. Welcome back. Uh, last week's show was about um, uh, Space 2.0 mm -hmm. or the second coming of space mm -hmm. and um, what what was happening inside of space and uh, kind of like what we're talking about. Now, we are seriously, seriously talking about it in this show when we put permanent human habitations on the moon. And I don't think we sound crazy. Now maybe that's because we're well, a little bit. Maybe because we're space geeks, we, I don't feel like we sound crazy. But it's it's a it's a, we are living in a time where this is a serious discussion right. of something that will happen in our lifetime, yeah. and that's a really cool thing, right? right. So um, last week's discussion was space 2.0 and how all of that uh, relates to everyone. So uh, this one comes from Super Neon One, which was. I missed you guys. I missed you a lot. But how can I be informed in time when the next show is going to be in time? Attention in Greenwich Mean Time. Can you send emails if we subscribe somewhere? Uh, the answer is kind of. So uh, with that Patreon uh, uh, program that we're on now, we made it up to our first milestone, which was $200 per episode. And that allows us to use a live stream uh, pro, I think it is. It's like the second from top account. It's not enterprise. It's the one right below that. And part of that is you can add the live event to your calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also, if you um, follow us on live stream, uh, we will notify you when we go live. So you get a real-time notification of when we go live. I think that is the best way to get a notification of when Space Vcast Live is happening. Otherwise, uh, everything we do is in UTC, according to Universal Time, which is uh, just a modern version of Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time is accurate to, like I think, a second. According to Universal Time, is based on atomic time. From a time, zo time zone standpoint, they're pretty much identical. So uh, GMT is basically phased out and replaced with UTC, which is why we use that. It's also what spacecrafts use. We're also 2100 UTC every 2, Saturday. 2100. I wanted to get my little time speech yes, in there. Yes, I 2100 know. UTC every Saturday. Uh, we'll let you know when we're not on air. Just assume that we will be on air. 2100 UTC. That is 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time or 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And remember, UTC does not honor daylight saving time. All right, uh, this one comes from um, Glander Blumberg. Uh, now, you only, you guys only get a little snippet of what this entire comment is because it's long, but basically, I keep wondering how much people outside of the fans of Spaceflight actually care about what is happening. When I move outside of geek groups, especially offline meetings and gatherings, I find talking about space policy is a complete dud of a topic. The only semi-recent topic that I've broached with political groups that has any traction is the uh, motive to build yet another spaceport in a state that does not have one right now either as a long-term potential policy issue. I like to compare support for space issues like the Pellet River in Nebraska. You need to see it to believe it. A mile wide and an inch deep. I do need to see that. That sounds yeah, awesome. If you try to push people on space policy issues, they quickly give up, give up, even though I think if you ask random people from all walks of life in America and, frankly, the rest of the world, too, they would all agree that something needs to happen in space. Still, very few are even aware of what is happening, and that is why we are here. That is what space Cast does. We want to get you engaged with space. We want to keep you informed with happening in space and general policy. Uh, we want to get you excited about space. And I think we do that. I like to think we do that in a fun, live, interactive, non-boring sort of way weekly. Um, and we're always open to comments as to how to make the show better and more awesome. Um, but yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. I think that um, fans of space are intimately in tune with it. But that's going to be true of anything in life, right? I actually would slightly disagree. Okay. Um, I think a lot of times uh, fans of space uh, sort of also take a niche within that category and don't always know everything. I mean, who, nobody's going to know everything. That's just a given statement. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like there are plenty of people that are so-called space nuts. Mm-hmm. And uh, I will say something about Blue Origin, 
or well nobody knows anything about blue origin but uh even blue origin doesn't know about blue origin <laughs> um even say virgin galactic or the, the confusion over virgin galactic versus spacex and all of those other sort of things going on um even though people say oh no no, no but i love space and i want to be an astronaut someday or whatever it is and what do you mean the space shuttle is not flying anymore i think there's still a lot of confusion out there uh even for those people who might consider themselves to be rocket scientists i don't think it's confusion i think it's ignorance Sure, sure, but you don't you don't always have the time to know everything, right? Uh, it's but it's the willingness to to learn about it, sure. or uh, you know pick up the mobile device you most likely have on you at the time, hit this cool website, and go. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Now I know more about it. I think it's all how you broach the topic, right? You can't. You got to feel out the room, right? You're not going to go in the room and be like space to a, a group that's completely uninterested in anything, right? I mean, it's it, it, true of anything in life. It's just conversational yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we give you enough topics to talk about. For example, what happens on the moon when we land? Who owns that, who owns that space? And but, talking points. And talking if points. You will. And how are we going to get to the moon? And who's going to do it? And what's going to happen? The space launch system versus, you know, other launching vehicles in that class that I can't think of. Um, stuff like that. So, uh, But good yeah. luck. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I don't, I don't think s- space at this level is mainstream, and that's why a show like this isn't on TV, because it's not. But remember, we do have the Science Channel, and we do have Discovery Channel, kind of, uh, and they do air a lot of stuff about the cosmos. And to that point, the cosmos is actually coming back with Neil deGrasse Tyson. On Fox. On Fox. That's going to be awesome, and that's going to open up that frontier even more. So I don't disagree with you, but I feel like the, the, it's, the frontier is cracking open right more and more people are starting to get interested in this stuff and go yeah oh oh i can go to space i I can buy a ticket to go to space myself i can make that happen oh we are going back we've got a rover a live rover on the moon humanity does on the moon right now that's pretty cool we've got we've got a suv sized rover on mars right now and that does hit mainstream media right in another year y'all are just gonna sound like hipsters (laughs) i was into space before everyone else was um, <laughs> we need to loop back around to that and turn yeah. that into like a little promo thing. Oh, I was in the space before it was mainstream. Uh, Michael says, oh, I think the second coming of space is truly the beginning of space exploration. In the past, we ventured into space for many reasons, but predominantly national security. Mm-hmm. Now, for the most part, we go to learn. And uh, yeah, I agree. And, and we should keep learning. There's, there's no bad reason. I, well, I shouldn't say there's no bad reason to go to space. Uh, but, you know, national security is one thing, but learning is a whole other ballgame. And I, I think we should continue to. We should always continue to learn, but I think we should continue to go to learn. I we think. choose to go. It's go time. Uh, for, <laughs> that's, uh, that is from Mission Space in Epcot at Disney World. Um, it is go time. It is go time. Uh, Fabio says... Back again. Back again. Oh, from last week, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't try... I try not to double up yeah, on... Yeah, no, Fabio uh, just, okay, just yeah, like last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Space 2.0 is not a fad. The resurgence is based on economics. Today is cheaper. Hardware is more compact and powerful. Things are going to happen... Things are happening. My only regret is that we will not happen as fast as in the software industry. Now, that is true today, but... Uh, I think we're going to see a change even in that with the uh, advent of direct laser metal sintering uh, or 3D printing metal rocket parts, essentially. Yeah. Eventually, you could just 3D print a rocket or you could 3D print designs of a rocket. Now, you right now, parts are only, you know, yay big. It's still really big, yeah. but it's not a rocket. Oh, and food is still only this big, but... You know, We're it's, not, it's not a whole rocket. It, it's just a, you, if you could scale it up, then yeah, you could do some pretty cool things with that. Yeah, and you could do it a lot faster. If you've ever seen a DLMS machine make something, it's fast in that it's faster than doing it by hand? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty slow. It's pretty slow. It goes la- laser goes. You're like, ah, oh. you've got DLMS over here and paint dry. 
All right, who's gonna win? Go. <laughs> Sad. Oh, that's terrible. But but I'm sure that will get faster. The process will get faster. Yeah, yeah, it will yeah, get yeah. larger. It will get cooler. Lasers. Um, and um, lasers and hopefully in our lifetime. So that's a, that's a cool thing that will happen. And you know, I think the advent of discovery and new cool things in space probably won't happen at the rate of a cell phone, which is like once per year. Right. But look at what SpaceX is doing. Uh, and uh, again, work at SpaceX, not affiliated with the show at all. So no no connection there other than I'm just bringing up SpaceX. Uh, look at what they're doing with the F9 or dev program, right. um, with the, the new Dragon stuff. I mean, they're, they're in, uh, what has it been, like 11 years? That's uh, three different rockets mm-hmm. and... Um, what, like five different engines that yeah, they've made? that's not too shabby. That's not bad at all. I mean, you look at that, that's like a new engine every two years. That's not bad. That's that's pretty good. Uh, new design. Not not whole, not whole. building one, but new new design. Right, that's, that's right. That's pretty good. Um, this one comes from Eric. He says, about, uh, about one space launch system versus multiple Falcon Heavies. The concept being uh, one space launch system launch would be able to bring up a lot of payload, it would take two or three Falcon Heavies to bring up the same amount of payload. I think the term assembling in space is wrong. It would rather be a docking of three modules, something that is standard procedure since decades. Even the old moon missions did some reconfiguration and docking with other components. Those components could have been started with multiple rockets. I don't think, I think they didn't do it that way because they were in a hurry to get everything to the moon with one big shot, but we have enough time to plan and think differently. Um, that's actually a very valid point. So um, last week I had said, uh, look, you're talking about uh, three Falcon Heavy launches would still be less than a space launch system launch right. at a billion and a half dollars for that space launch system launch. But uh, you have to assemble in space and make you the assumption that, oh, that will be cheap is not a safe assumption because right. you look at the International Space Station, most expensive structure humans have ever built. Eric's point is, well, yeah, but you don't have to do it that way. You could just launch three things, have a universal docking uh, ring, essentially, dock three or four things together from Falcon Heavy, right. and you haven't, you've assembled in space, but really it was just a docking procedure to make all of that go, and now suddenly you've got a craft that was four times as large and you'd be able to go. Yeah, um, I think assembling not in a space, bad point. Not yeah. a bad point. Assembling I, in space, I think, conjures up the images uh, from like Star Trek movies where they're actually out there welding in space and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And I, I think, yeah, that that might be just a terminology uh, miscommunication. So I, I, you know, I, uh, Eric, you might be right. I, it might be possible if we were to dock in space and, and create design it so that it's a very simple in space assembly. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be very doable. Yeah, yeah, might be cool. Also, it might be the weak points. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. In- interesting, interesting. But concept. interesting, very. Um, two more, really quick. Uh, glass, glassage, glissage. I have no idea. Awesome. Regarding funding engines, uh, parts, and such on using Kickstarter, I don't think that's a good idea because the most, actually the only, successful Kickstarter campaigns are the ones that have substantial rewards. There's not much you can give when you've got part of an engine. Challenge accepted, I disagree. So with a rocket engine, wouldn't you love to go down and actually watch the test firings of those engines as single units and as multiple units? Wouldn't you like to be a part of that process? Wouldn't you love to be able to tour the factory and see where they're made? Wouldn't you love to do all of these different things? All of those could be Kickstarter rewards. A reward doesn't have to cost a lot of money. In fact, the better Kickstarter rewards are the ones that don't cost the creator anything. They're free for the creator, but they're valuable to you. Um, Using this as an example, I'm going to use SpaceX again. Same disclaimer from before. Imagine you have the opportunity to go watch the test firing of an M1D engine because SpaceX does test fire every engine before it goes in the vehicle. Wouldn't you love a chance to go out and see that? You could do the exact same thing for whatever engine is kickstart funded, blah, blah, blah. And if it's small enough, I can make a coffee table out of it. If it's small enough, you can, in fact, make a coffee table out of it. For that reference, you're going to have to go back in time and look at other. So it's just finding a good way to create rewards that are valuable to the users, but don't cost a lot of money and come against uh, the engine. Don't go against the engine itself. So I think that's completely possible. You just need people that are far more creative than I to actually come up with said rewards. And this is the last comment of of the uh, of the week it's Valken 321 I just realized he got his tomorrow thing <laughs> yeah 
So on that note, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, we're going to uh, come back at you uh, next week. We might have a live guest next week. For those of you who are Space Vidcast patrons um, at the, I believe it's the $10 level, uh, you will have, if we do have a guest, uh, we will email you and you'll have early access to ask the guest questions so that you can send those in to us, we'll let you know who the guest is going to be, sending your questions and we will ask your questions on air. For everyone else, can we just not tell them who it is? Yeah, just we're random guest. guest. Random guest. Good you luck. don't get to know ask who. Ask whatever you ask like. Whatever Whatever you want. Um, for everyone else, uh, we look forward to uh, joining. Hopefully, you'll join us live right here at uh, spacevidcast.com. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in a week.